And we're going to get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Greg Kahn, and I'm the CEO of GK Digital Ventures. Thank you for joining us. I know everyone's schedule is packed with their first virtual CES, but I'm thrilled to be joined by some of the most innovative executives in our industry today. With the global media experiencing rapid and constant evolution and an increasing number of companies and organizations joining the content business, both in terms of creation and distribution, the Home Living Room presents a venue with tremendous opportunity for business expansion and innovation. And I'm thrilled today to introduce the panelists and I'm gonna ask each of you to um, just give a little brief about the role that you play, the company that you're at, and then we'll get into today's conversation. Um, and so Scott Rosenberg at Roku, Grace Dolan at Samsung Electronics, Pete Peterson at Sonos, and Aaron McPherson at Verizon. Welcome all. And Scott, I'm going to turn it to you first to introduce yourself. Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Rosenberg. I lead Roku's platform business. So I'm responsible for all app and content distribution on the Roku platform, as well as our ad business. And I'm based out of New York. Thank you, Scott. Grace. Hi, everyone. My name is Grace Dolan. I'm at Samsung Electronics. Um, I am the head of marketing for the home entertainment division. Um, glad to be here. Glad to have you, Grace. Uh, Pete. Hey, everyone. Pete Peterson. I head up global marketing for Sonos. I'm based in Seattle, occasionally Santa Barbara. It's great to be here and look forward to an engaging discussion. Thank you, Pete. And Aaron. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a good CES. I'm Aaron McPherson. I'm the head of content and partnerships for Verizon Consumer Group. That essentially means my team and I look after content across all of our consumer platforms. And I'm currently based somewhere in upstate New York, but, you know, TBD. <laughs> We've got all corners of the, of the country covered and uh, we'll jump right into uh, to our conversation. I always like to start these conversation with, with conversations with some news and statistics around the immersive at-home experience, just to underscore the level of growth and disruption that's taking place in this industry. In this year where technology has played a crucial role in keeping people connected, a period of time that I call the now normal, it might not be surprising that monthly technology sales have been up year over year since last March when COVID restrictions began in the US. In the months that followed, technology sales experienced double digit year over year growth. And this momentum is expected to continue well into 2021. In fact, according to NPD's Future of Technology report, Q4 2020 was projected to have historic growth of 18% compared with the same quarter in 2019. 2020 saw healthy gains in categories associated with, with learning and working from home as consumers across the US outfitted their home Zoom offices with the equipment needed to maintain productivity. Gains in home entertainment categories were notable as well as consumers looked for ways to fill time while at home for an extended period. We saw high growth in categories including notebook computers, tablets, monitors, printers, keyboards, and mice. And we know that media consumption is it rapidly increasing too. Nielsen studies show that the homebound consumers have led to a 60% increase in the amount of video content watched globally. And Double Verify's recent study took it even further saying that consumers have doubled the amount of content they consume on a daily basis. Wow, there's a lot going on guys in, uh, in our world today. And I wanna start with a question to each of you and, and uh, Grace, I'm gonna start with you, is that as a result of all these lifestyle changes people made during the global pandemic, their relationship with technology changed. Lifestyles became intertwined with technology. We see smart scales and assistance, lights and television speakers that are all working together. What positive changes have you seen at Samsung in the past year that gives you optimism going forward? Sure. So I'm excited to answer that question. Um, you're right. Consumers' relationships with technology really transformed in the last year. I think the technology that we wanted became the technology that we needed, right? So, and I think specifically about TVs, because that's my biggest, um, the biggest product in my portfolio. But, you know, TVs are fun, 
like, ooh, new big shiny TV. And really that TV became, you know, a, a part-time, you know, fitness uh, source, a part-time entertainment source, part-time um, remote, you know, work and learning. You know, people were extending classrooms onto their TVs, casting video conferences. Um, it became a, one of the many hubs in the home as all of the rooms in your home became more and more multi-purpose. Um, probably some of the more exciting innovations that came out of this were related to really recreating external experiences within the home. And one of my favorites is, is health because I was such a gym rat before, <laughs> before 2020 and that just disappeared. Um, we had actually just launched Samsung Health on our TVs at the beginning of 2020. And so that made a ton of classes available for you know, in, you know, people who just didn't have that, that gym outlet. This year, we kind of leveled it up even further. We integrated an optional camera. And now there's a smart trainer integrated into our, um, you know, our, our health platform. So using AI, they'll check out your form. They'll let you know, you know how you're doing. They'll give you um, real-time feedback. They'll track against all of your other Samsung devices. So you have the full ecosystem um, of kind of health and wellness tracking. I have to say, I have... 100% form uh, scores on my squats. Just very proud. <laughs> Impressive. And we're going to ask you to- Thank you. have been working out. on it. <laughs> <laughs> very good, Grace. Uh, Pete, over to you next. What positive changes have you seen in the, in the past year that gives you optimism going forward? Yeah, for sure. I mean, as Grace indicated, home has become the center of our lives um, with everything being at home, whether it's school or fitness or certainly entertainment opportunities, whether it's first run movies uh, being streamed at home or sports events being um, uh, primarily uh, viewed and enjoyed at home. Our role in all of this is obviously to make these content experiences sound amazing. Uh, the audio experience is obviously a big part of the overall experience. So we, we've really focused on making it as easy as possible for customers to get a great audio experience whether it's just adding a, a Sonos soundbar, either a beam or an arc to your Samsung television, uh, or if you really want you know, to amp it up a little bit, uh, adding a, a sub or adding rear surrounds. Again, our role is to make it as easy as possible. And we've really seen consumers embrace this idea of creating these amazing audio spaces within their homes to, to, to get the most out of the content that they're enjoying. I don't think these trends are going to stop anytime soon. Uh, certainly, you know, we've seen this uh, um, uh, sort of positive uh, push from, from people's investment in home over the past, call it two quarters, um, but that's not going to stop anytime soon. So we're, we're prepared to keep making it easy for people to enjoy great content at home. Thank you, Pete. Aaron, in 2021, brands and technology will be remixing entertainment experiences through new service offerings and entertainment bundles. Grace just spoke about Samsung's health and wellness uh, innovations, and we're seeing a lot of innovation also in music and gaming and education to create stickier subscription bundles. So consumers become lifetime loyalists. What new category of content do you think that consumers are craving in this period of the now normal? Wow, that's a great question. I've been thinking as I'm listening to my fellow panelists and your intro, um, you know, your stats are right in line with what we're seeing at Verizon. Uh, we sprang into action when, you know, this pandemic hit our shores and really worked to keep everybody connected. And the network that underlies all of it is really our core value prop here is making sure that people are connected and stay connected. Um, to your point, we saw a lot of demand for gaming, and I don't see that stopping. So the statistics you, you raised, Greg, are right about in line with what we saw on the network, 70% increases, and that was in gaming, 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 gaming. I can see that um, start to expand. So what kinds of new bundles? I think those bundles are multi-purpose. And this kind of goes to something Grace was saying, and actually Pete's saying, you know, no longer do you have a video bundle and a gaming bundle and a fitness bundle. I think what's really exciting is that we'll put consumers at the center and perhaps there's a bundle where it offers gaming that incorporates fitness, there's commerce, right? And content, you know, and we can start to 
really serve consumer interests across a number of categories. But gaming would be one that I would definitely keep an eye on, especially as we've seen groundbreaking um, events like the Travis Scott concert in Fortnite. So, you know, those gaming platforms start to become virtual platforms where people gather and connect. I'm really glad you brought that up, Barrett, because I've been sharing that this is the year that the game, the gaming industry comes out of the figurative basement, if you will. It's, it, it is firmly entrenched into the, into the living room and even outside the home, uh, the gamification of everything, yeah. but yes. really, really, Pokemon, really. Pokemon, you just, you know, I just, I, we have a big partnership with Niantic. We're the official 5G partner for them. And you're right. They, they pivoted. Yes, you can still play outside of home, but they pivoted to be inside of the home too. So, you know, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. Thank you for, for sharing that. Scott, uh, over to you, my friend. Um, you know, one of the most interesting stories last year related to, to the launch uh, of Quibi. And of course, there was a, a very timely announcement right before CES that, uh, that Roku is, has the intent to acquire uh, Quibi's content and assets. And so, uh, you know, I'd love to, to ask you fresh on the, the heels of that announcement, what are, what are the content areas of content that you're seeing at Roku, which is, of course, uh, a leader in, in the streaming world, uh, that you're the most bullish leading into 2021? Yeah, thanks. Great question. I, I am excited about the Quibi news. Lots of great programming. It's, a, it's, it's too bad it didn't, uh, didn't prevail in its, uh, in its initial form, but we think it's a great lineup, amazing talent. And uh, you'll be seeing it on the Roku channel for free, uh, a pivot of a business model, not subscription-based. And we think it's going to do really well. Uh, you know, more, more broadly, the, the pandemic has forced people to work from home. And it's driven an enormous acceleration of the purchase of streaming devices, connected televisions, and consumption, game, game use. I have two teenage boys. I was surprised to find my broadband Use was over a terabyte last month. There's a lot of game playing happening in this household. Um, so I think consumers took what was already a significant secular trend towards streaming. And especially with the loss of news, with the loss of live sports, they just cut the cord and really moved their habits very significantly and in a permanent way. And we, we've seen that very strongly on the Roku platform. We just crossed 50 million active accounts, which is our proxy for a household. Uh, viewership is up 55% year over year, just in terms of streaming hours. Consumption's way up, and it's up across the board. Entertainment, news, interestingly, streaming live services uh, have done very well. You, you, know, you wouldn't have thought in streaming that live linear feeds would be a thing, but in fact, it's a very attractive consumer habit to be able to channel flip. You're flipping through virtual linear channels. We've got over 150 channels in the Roku channel that are doing doing well. So I would describe the consumption uptick as broad based, uh, but certainly very strong in uh, linear ad supported consumption. Thank you. So um, Pete, I want to talk a little bit about voice activation. Of course, you're one of the leaders at Sonos for sure. I'm a proud owner of much of uh, much of your product, as as all of you. Um, it's it's clearly been one of the trends at CES, not just this year, but in previous years. But voice is is everywhere. Voice activation is is everywhere, and um, we're seeing widespread adoption of products from yourself and and Samsung and Google and Amazon, among among others. What do you think has changed with respect to voice activation during this COVID period, and and what what sort of new experiences are you seeing be, being activated? And, and what do you project to see in kind of the months ahead as we, as we roll through um, the various lockdowns and, and reemerge into society? Well, first and foremost, Greg, thanks for being a, a Sonos owner. We appreciate each and every one of our customers. So thank you. Um, in terms of voice, look, voice is a, a big part of the Sonos experience. We find that people 
are using voice more and more to get to music faster. It's just removing, um, you know, one of those steps you need to take, whether you're using an app or, or somebody else's app, uh, that, that can be burdensome. And people we have found just enjoy uh, asking for the Beatles to play. And all of a sudden, the voice assistant will, will call up the Beatles. That's a, a very frictionless experience. And, and people are, are using it more and more. Um, in terms of where it's going, a great question. Who knows, right? But we really see uh, a future in which um, two things happen. One, um, we think there's a, a world in which all of these voice assistants can live concurrently together. Uh, we see interoperability between voice assistants being a key trend, uh, and we're pushing very hard in the industry to make that so. We also see space for specialized voice assistants. Uh, these all-purpose assistants are terrific. The ability to ask for an Uber or get the weather or get a, a pizza delivered, those are all fine and well, uh, but we think there is space for voice assistants that are purpose-built to do very specific things, and because they're deep in those experiences, experiences, they're going to be much richer experiences. So look for more voice assistants, uh, look for voice assistants being able to work together with one another. Thanks, Pete. The intercom has become a huge, uh, a huge feature in my, my uh, family. My kids are calling us to dinner with, uh, with their various voice assistants. So it's a, it's, it's, it's been a, a fun uh, evolution. Aaron, I want to talk to, to, to this group a little bit about virtual and augmented reality. Of course, it's a sector that many of us have been in for quite a bit of time. Some would say that the, the rollout has been slower than one would expect it. I did play with my daughter about an hour yesterday. Um, you know, some industry experts have said that the next step for reality will be assisted, not augmented. Question for you is, when do you think virtual and augmented reality, of course, they're different, there are nuances to both, but when do you think that they will become mainstream? Great question. Um, we really look toward the launch of glasses and, and should I say, easier uh, wearable devices, which will probably be, I mean, we're, we're of course partnered with the you know usual suspects who would be um, working on that hardware, but it's probably looking like 22. It would be more the year for the glasses. And um, not that virtual reality is not amazing, because it is, as you said, it's got some fantastic experiences in it, but widespread adoption really comes when it's easier to toggle between the real world and the augmented world. And to your point, um, you know, this technology will enable us, I think of it, think about the next CES when you can have in your glasses, you know, who's approaching you at that cocktail mixer. Gee, I know I've seen them before, what's their name, you know? And actually get that data, who they are, what their title is, what their LinkedIn says, um, in addition to supplementing other existing live experiences, sports. We've been doing a lot of that at Verizon and of course working with the NFL, whom we sponsor on augmenting those live games with data rich experiences, with the opportunity to see real time stats and review plays from different camera angles, all within your field of vision. And so it, I, I absolutely agree with the statement that it will just be something that enhances existing experiences, not replaces them. Yeah, it's a it was very, very good uh, points, Aaron, with the Miami Dolphins out of the playoffs this year. It was quieter at, uh, as usual, uh, per usual, and, uh, and normally during football season. But Grace, I want to turn it to you, too, as, as well, in, in this conversation around virtual and augmented reality and just your point of view on, on this. You know, we I think a lot of us had this vision that during the COVID lockdown with, with education, that there's so many really interesting applications that could be brought out with virtual and augmented reality. Just from your perspective, when do you truly think it's going to become mainstream? I think there's, you know, I think there's baby steps. We're getting there. I think at first the initial reaction was that it's a little too too many steps. I think the industry is working to alleviate. And then the other piece of it is it's a little too real for something that's not real. And I think that's that's another area that we're um, we're just as a society so much more embracing of new technologies. I think part of it was this giant leap from this past year. It's obviously the direction we've been moving in. Give us a couple more years. It's going to become more and more mainstream and we'll start seeing it, I think, in public spaces first with large groups. 
I think we're going to start seeing it, you know, Aaron, to your point, at games, in stadiums, in, in large group settings. Um, and, then, and then people will start bringing it home a little bit more. And I think that will help kind of, you know, we always say bring the, bring the game home like with TV, because it's so immersive and it's amazing. And between the sound quality, you know, amplifying the experience to the, the resolution and picture quality, making it feel like real life, people are getting closer and closer to wanting that experience and the embracing will start. That's, I mean, just end of one, but yeah, we're getting there. I love that. And sports often drives technology. And so it's a, it's a really important point. Scott, I want to turn to to this really interesting trend that we're seeing around ownership versus u- usership. You know, as we as we think about the the new generation of of consumers, many in today's world prefer to subscribe or become a member of a service rather than owning a physical or digital good. If we were having this conversation in digital Hollywood a couple of decades ago, we would be talking about DVDs and VHSs prior to that, and it's a whole different world right now. Where do you think the subscription model is headed within the next 10 years? Well, that's a great question. Well, I mean, you don't have to look any further than than the music industry to see what uh, usership and subscription can do to to unit sales. I do think we'll see, and we have some evidence of this playing out with video, where as these incredibly compelling very fully loaded subscription services, uh, a Disney Plus, an HBO Max, a Peacock come come to bear. And as they offer a deeper and richer set of viewing, a more consumer-friendly experience than was available in the traditional pay TV model, that it, it does bite into transactional uh, uh, purchases, uh, rentals of movies, because you don't, there's so much to choose from. On the other hand, the pandemic has, of course, really damage the theatrical business caused a lot of studios to look to do day and date release of titles to streaming services. We've got HBO Max debuting 17 theatrical titles this year just for being a member of H- of, uh, of uh, HBO Max. All the Warner titles will be available this year. Uh, and and uh, on the, Disney, on the other hand, is, is selling those as, a, as, a, as an added value on top of the Disney Plus subscription. We'll continue to see some experimentation there. Uh, so I, th- I, th- I still think there's a, a business, a meaningful business around super premium uh, on-demand transactional revenues, but in video more broadly, um, the, the advent of subscription, the availability of a wide array of ad supported programming, basically the availability of everything ever produced and being produced a few clicks away uh, does probably lessen the importance of ownership, which I think is the back to your original question. Yeah, Pete, I want to turn it to you too as well, because I think audio, there's been so much innovation in audio as it relates to, 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 to the types of products that are out there. And of course, podcasts were all the rage, you know, last year, previously when everybody was traveling. Um, what are your thoughts on, on subscription as it relates to audio? Where do you see that going? Well, the great news is that consumers have a ton of choices, right? We see a lot of uh, existing subscription services enjoying great success, more listenership, more engagement. We see new subscription services, um, including Sonos Radio and Sonos Radio HD starting to take off. So there's no lack of appetite for content, that's for sure. And I think it's uh, it's been proven that consumers are willing to pay for, for high quality content. Uh, the big question becomes how long are they willing to pay for that and how many subscriptions are they willing to have? I think that's something for all of us in the industry to keep an eye on is this whole idea sort of subscription apathy. Uh, I know I look at my uh, credit card bill every month and I'm like, God, this, you know, do I really need to pay for that one and that one and that one? Do I need all three? And of course, as content becomes exclusive to some of these streaming services, I think we're going to see uh, a, a real um, uh, vote by consumers on what subscription services they value and which ones they don't. And honestly, that's kind of what happened with cable, right? So <laughs> there was traditional right. yeah, TV and then you started totally. signing up for channels for that premium content. And then are we going to walk away entirely? Um, I think we're going to see aggregation. That's, it's just a must because there's going to be such no more tolerance for all those little mini channels and all those mini subscriptions. But yeah, it's funny to see history replay. So I, 
I think we'll see more de-aggregation followed by re-aggregation. So you're right. It's unbundling right now as everybody goes direct to consumer. Then there's a glut of SVODs and then a bundle. And of course, we see content owners like Disney bundling with the Disney bundle their own services. What I'm hopeful about is that those of us, you know, in that re-aggregation stay consumer centric. Yeah. What happened what happened to the cable TV industry or what is happening is that it we lost sight of consumers, you know, I should say the programmers, I, we, we distribute, we have a, an MVPD on the East Coast, but when you see all of the contractual limitations around people actually being able to choose their programming and then pay for what they watch, you know, we, we at Verizon are doing our part to provide, you know, what we call mix and match, which is really the most customer centric that we could possibly be, but let's face it, the contractual constraints put in place by the programming industry became too much. And then I think you get the, you know, the consumer saying voting with their pocketbook. No, I'm going to cut the cord and just subscribe to what I want. Yeah. And then there's also the piece of just finding the content, right? So, yeah. there's, and, and I think there are a couple of band-aid, band-aids available now. Like we have an, we have a content aggregator on our TVs that helps to offset some of that, but there's a lot of issues that have to be kind of patched up in order to really be consumer first. Yeah. Yeah, and I think given given the universe of content we all are all uh, navigating, and, and that's not a bad thing, right? It's terrific to have so many choices. And by the way, this is awesome content we're talking about, right? We've got uh, an amazing amount of really rich, really engaging content to choose from. But I think given the amount of content we've got to wade through, there will be an emergence of, let's call it uh, a curatorial voice, an editorial voice that helps consumers navigate that based on your preferences, your choices, and so forth. I would love somebody to give me sort of a, a daily or a weekly watch list of, okay, across all the platforms, here are the must watch shows or here are the must listen to uh, album drops of the week. We kind of do that on our TVs. So we use AI based on kind of like the Netflix model, um, you know, where they, based on what you have watched before, we think you'll like this, but we do that across the universe of content. So between OTT and we'll put the ones that you're subscribed to at the forefront, um, but then broad, uh, broadcast and then you know our, our fast channel our TV plus channel so it's there it's not a it's not a newsletter it's not for everyone but go buy a TV from Samsung and you'll get it <laughs> I'll trade you a Sonos speaker for a Samsung TV deal <laughs> I love it I, I love it I think it's so interesting what we're talking about today because a couple a couple of key points that I'm picking up here one is to keep consumer in mind, I think that gets lost so much in the conversation around tech job, technology, even though we're at a, a consumer technology show. I think that it's you know really thinking about that consumer behavior. Um, but the second is, is that the, the, when we're talking about bundles, even in today's session, we're talking about so many different types of content, you know, from video to audio, from fitness to education to gaming to music that now becomes part of that, that set that consumers are thinking about. And so it, it's l- less of sort of just the traditional entertainment and, and more about just their overall universe and how they're, they're voting with their pocketbooks is, is I think is gonna be a fascinating thing to come out of this and to figure out how we all, how we all sort of collaborate in this, in this really evolving um, kind of space. I wanna talk a little bit about data and personalization as it relates to consumer, because I think, you know, again, we, we have a lot of conversations as an industry about data, all of these new um, screens and devices that have come out are increasing the footprint about uh, the amount of data that can be collected about from individual users. But we know, and we all have been um, fortunately uh, able to, to sort of see how data can, can work for us to create personalized experiences that just help us in our day-to-day life. And Grace, you were just mentioning that about when the new TVs that, you know, can surfacing the, the content that the consumer wants to see at the top is very helpful, right, in a, in a, in a cluttered world. Aaron, I want to start with you just about how do you see the future of leveraging big data to create more personalized experiences for the consumer? That is exactly what we are hard at work on at Verizon is just that, Greg. So leveraging the customer data that we have access to, to create seamless, you know, frictionless consumer experiences so that as a Verizon customer, 
we know not only which products and services you already have, but we're able to recommend you know, the perfect consumer experience, whether it's the new plan, the new device, the new product or service on top of it. And that when you access our .com or our app, you're gonna have the same seamless experience as you have when you walk into a retail location. So it's also creating a seamless hole between our many touch points, whether you've made a customer call and you're talking to one of our reps or walking into a store, but that would be part of the same narrative. Um, of course, within that is also protecting customer data and ensuring that we're transparent about how and when we're using it. So transparency anchors all of it. You know, to, 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 to have that trust level, we've got to be transparent and we intend to be with our customer about how and when we're going to use their data and when we're not using their data, namely not sharing their data with third so, parties. So important. Yeah. Especially, especially right now. Scott, I'd love to get your point of view on that too. And just how Roku kind of thinks about data to create personalized experiences. Yeah. My view is that data uses of data, machine learning are all about being more respectful and efficient with the consumer's time. Consumer starts their Roku up. What apps, what content are they going to see? How can you help them more efficiently get where they're going, which is a video viewing session. And so at, at its best use, it is delivering the consumer to where they want to go sooner. And I think from a content perspective, you know, whether it's in the Roku channel or, or another service, the, the goal is to guide the consumer to something quickly, efficiently, and, and that should come back to the, the proprietor of the data in terms of better engagement, better retention. It's also obviously got significant application in advertising, but there again, I think the goal is the same. How do we get out of this world of 15, 16 minutes on the hour of TV advertising, bludgeoning a consumer with just irrelevant ads, repetitive ads? How can we shrink the ad load, make the ads more relevant, more engaging? Consumers want free and ad supported content. It's the fastest growing segment on our platform for six, seven years running now. Uh, and that's because consumers need the help funding uh, the, the content that they want to consume. They can't afford to stack all paid ad free services uh, to get to the consumption they want. So advertising plays a vital role, but, but how can we use data to deliver a better experience that meets the marketer's needs and is more respectful of the consumer. And that, that's, how we've, that's how we've thought about and used data at Roku. And it, it's, going, it's going very well. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how once you break through kind of the editorial mindset of like, I'm going to think of my audience as 10 segments or whatever it is that we, is, we grew up with in, in, in early marketing, uh, and, uh, and build the right infrastructure, how you can really deliver a, a radically more personalized experience, both on content and advertising. It's really interesting points and in bringing up kind of the, the advertising theme is that not all consumers can pay for this incredible content that, that is being um, produced and distributed. And so having a tier that is, is ad supported is welcomed by some, and uh, especially if it's, if it's relevant. Uh, advertising. But Pete, I want to stay on that theme around speakers because it, in some of the conversations that, that we had last year, uh, we were you know, talking about at that time, more than half of owners had ordered an item on speakers. We're seeing the, the explosion of e-commerce this, this past year, but even in last year, more than half of, of consumers had ordered a product via speakers and more than a third had made a purchase over $100 so not, without even seeing the product you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, using that as a mechanism to, to acquire it. Question for you is in this world of exploding screens and, and devices is what steps from a UI or UX perspective do you think needs to be, need to be developed in order to enhance that consumer experience and to make voice commerce even more prevalent? There's really three things. Um, the first is making sure the, the basic wake word mechanic is better than it is today. I think we've all experienced frustration 
uh, with you know false wake word uh, identification and an interruption of whatever it is you're listening to or enjoying. Um, and I think what that tells us, it's, it's still early days in voice technology, right? We've got a lot of work to do uh, to make this experience as awesome as it's going to be in the future, but right now it's still not perfect. Uh, the second piece um, to, to the points that have been made earlier is making sure we're paying close attention to, to the privacy aspect of this. Um, you know, it's great to be able to, to order something with your voice, uh, but let's make sure that that's the only thing that's being transmitted to the technology companies or the platforms that are accepting those orders uh, and nothing else. Uh, and we take great care to make sure that that is the case on the Sonos platform. Um, and the third thing is really ensuring that that experience, uh, if you are ordering something using a, a smart speaker, um, is, is additive to the overall experience, right? Uh, although we are seeing an increase in the number of people who are using that feature, using that functionality, um, we're also seeing some frustration with that. Uh, so, so again, I think it's early days. I think we're gonna see great improvement in the overall experience, uh, but the key for us is making sure it's additive and not something that, that distracts from enjoying the content that, that you're listening to at whatever given time. That's uh, great advice. I want to talk about 5G a bit because Hans is giving one of the keynotes here at uh, CES, and this is, uh, as they say, this is the year of 5G, Aaron. So we're gonna we're gonna dive into that a little bit. You know, in a lot of the work that I do in, in blending media and technology, we have conversations about how technology can augment human activity, not replace it, but serve as a, as an aid, as a guide to to technology. Question for you is, do you think that consumers understand what 5G technology is today? And, and secondly, in this conversation, as we're talking about the, the immersive at home experience, how do you feel that 5G will affect content production and distribution? So the first part, do consumers understand? I would say they don't yet. Um, and in fact, that's because it's early days. Granted, the, the iPhone launch is a major inflection point. And of course, Samsung has some amazing 5G devices out too. But as those devices become more ubiquitous and we have more use cases, then consumers will really start to understand the power of 5G. So we're just at the beginning of that process. And um, what's exciting about it is, you know, everything's ahead of us as far as even creating the use cases. So, you know, I, I do think it will start in public spaces and venues where we can you know, implement 5G and have kind of a controlled environment. And then you'll really start to see what I'd say the smart stadium come to life, especially with what's going on in the world as people start to return to events. Let's hope, you know, knock wood, 2021 is the year where we'll start coming out of this and see 5G actually not, not only enhance the entertainment experience, but make it safer, make it more frictionless as people return to venues. And then it'll start to just, you know, supplement our everyday lives. So you can imagine what AR mapping would do to a city, not just for something like a Pokemon Go experience, but something where my entire, you know, life wandering through Manhattan is lit up with 5G technology because I'm able to see and do things uh, not just in reality, but in the layer on top where, you know, maybe I, I actually learned that a really good friend of mine is in that Starbucks. If I just cross 42nd street, I mean, what will it do to our concept of synchronicity? <laughs> we'll be able to, to map it all. And it's easy and fun to dream, but actually uh, it's here with what we're creating with partners like Snap and the NFL um, and the Met and the Smithsonian. Um, so, but it's early days, so it'll be it'll be something where you know we'll want to make sure that people are experiencing seamless things in 4G, and then there's that extra layer of magic that's that's enabled by the speed, the low latency, all the currencies of 5G. Um, just to address your your other part of your question quickly, um, I think we were we were talking about the home and what 5G does for the home, or no, for production. Um, Greg, do you mean the actual industry? Because we think it will revolutionize that part of it too. So actually what the entertainment industry is able to do with 5G, we're in discussions right now with a number of major studios around how they can reimagine production. You know, how, how can we reimagine filmmaking, utilizing that technology, what that does to cost structures, 
um, which actually goes right in hand with the new distribution models that will change monetization. So using not just drone technology, but actually real-time edit on say a football game um, and what, what that will do to the actual production process. Um, we're again, just at the beginning of those conversations. It's very cool to ideate around yeah. here. So thank you for, for sharing some perspectives. Great, uh, Grace and, and Andrew and, and, and uh, uh, sorry, Grace and Pete and Scott, any thoughts on, on 5Gs from, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, oh, <laughs> I, I'm so excited about 5G. Obviously we have a mobile division, but it, we, even within the home, as we talk about gaming, right? The future of gaming is going to be cloud and 5G is going to revolutionize cloud gaming. I don't know if any of you guys are gamers. Um, you know, it there's limitations in exploration around games because it takes so long right now in the current state to download a game. So unless you know you want to play it, you know you like the game, you're not likely to go and start downloading lots of different titles um, because of the the time commitment. And 5G will alleviate all of that. It's going to be a, a huge evolution in the way that we approach. Um, Ex exploration and play within gaming. Uh, I'd say I'm, I'm excited about it because it's just a further democratization of broadband access. You know, there's pretty good research out there that shows that when a household has a second, a third broadband option in their household, pricing and availability goes down because of competition. So I think, um, you know, the advent of 5G, especially fixed, uh, fixed wireless options for, for homes, just is is more even further down the path of giving consumers more more options for for great connections into their home thanks scott and pete yeah we're, we're super excited about any technology that makes it easier for consumers to love and enjoy the content uh, that they want to listen to um so you know sonos has kind of grown up in the home uh we you know quite recently introduced our first out of the home product the sonos move uh, this still relies on either bluetooth or or wi-fi um, but we imagine a future where potentially a sonos speaker could connect outside of the home via 5g to content services and again just make it that much easier for consumers to get to the bands that they love and 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 have that great listening experience anywhere they're traveling yeah, it's very cool to think about, Pete. We've had an unbelievable conversation today. I know that we can go on all day and I look forward to doing it again. I want to close today's session. Here we are at the first virtual CES and CES always sets the stage for what the tech agenda is gonna be for the, for the year ahead. And so on this theme of thinking about the, the hybrid of the consumer and experiences, what is one prediction that each of you could share for the year ahead related to consumer that you're expecting to see before we close out 2021. And Pete, since you're first on my screen here, I'm gonna go right back to you to start. Oh, okay, so um, it, it's a weird prediction because this of course is the consumer electronics show, but I actually think we're gonna see this massive trend of consumers embracing the outdoors and outdoor activities. Uh, and of course, technology will have a role to play in that. But I think because of the pandemic, we've all spent so much time at home that once we're able to, to get out there and bike and hike and play tennis and play golf and do all the things um, uh, that sort of release that energy, um, I think that's gonna be a huge, huge trend as consumers getting outside of their homes and just having fun uh, in mother nature and enjoying the best the world has to offer. I love it, Aaron. I think we're gonna see more sort of blockbuster events, if you will, that take place in virtual space. Um, that said, again, you know, we'll also see, it will be, it'll be a tale of two cities, one in which we're gathering inside of platforms like Discord or Fortnite or other spaces, whether it's for a huge concert or a sporting event, or, you know, I think that trend will continue, whether it's that, or, we will see a great desire to get together again and to use technology in safe ways to do that. You know, a, a partner of ours, Live Nation, uh, is talking about how to make sure that when they do a venued events again, it's safe from a health perspective. So technology will continue to evolve to ensure that we gather safely because people will want to. Lord knows I do. <laughs> I'm right there with you, Aaron. Grace, over to you, your consumer prediction. Um, I think, I don't know if it's, it's both the consumer and the, and the consumer um, 
products, companies, but I think technology is going to become more inclusive. Um, so we're, we're spending a lot of time in the home with technology and it's, I think, identifying gaps. So we talked a lot about voice, right? But what about our hearing impaired consumers? What are we doing using technology like AI to be able to have that experience with sign language, for example? I think that's something that, that brands will start working on um, so that everyone can enjoy the technology that we're making. Fantastic. And Scott? All right. Uh, I think theatrical releases to the home are here to stay. We'll see. But I don't think you get to put that cat back in the bag. And then I got a second one, which is that at the workplace, I, I think we're going to find ourselves in a world where companies compete on flexibility in, in the same way that we saw significant competition in Silicon Valley around maternity, paternity leaves, vacation policies, things like that. I think COVID's taught us a lot about what can be done remotely from home in more flexible work circumstances. And I think that'll be in the next domain that uh, especially tech companies end up having to compete on. All right, our, our tweetable quote for today is outdoor activities, blockbuster virtual events, inclusive technology, theatrical releases are here to stay, in the home are here to stay, so theatrical releases to home, and employers will compete on flexibility. This has been an awesome conversation, and thank you to Grace, Aaron, Scott, and Pete for joining me today. Appreciate everybody who's been able to listen in. Have a fantastic end of CES, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. For thank you. Me. Good to see you Thanks, all. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everyone.